Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. All right, notice what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Let's read that one more time. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray this morning. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church. God, I thank you, Lord, for the good service we've had already, all the good singing and just the good spirit and the good uh, testimonies. And, Father, already we felt your presence. We could leave right now and say it's been good to be in church. But, Lord, I pray that you help me now as I try to preach. And uh, I pray that you will uh, give me the words I need to say. Take all the ones that I don't, that all things might be done to glorify and uplift you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, thank you. You can be seated. Ephesians chapter number 6 deals with the home. Now, it's Father's Day, and I always say that uh, some of the hardest messages to preach are Father's Day messages and Mother's Day messages. There's only so much you can say about each. And if it's a little warm in here, I apologize. As you can see from the ceiling, we've had some condenser problems. We've got one AC unit that's struggling. So if it's a little, I'm not going to be long this morning, so, uh, so you, you, we, won't, we won't roast in here much. But, so if you're a little warm, I apologize. The AC is getting looked at again this week. So we may have to go out and cast some devils out of our AC unit. I'm not sure. Lay hands on it, anoint it with oil, do whatever. So if it's warm, I apologize, but we won't be long. We'll be out of here before 1.15 for sure. All right. That joke never gets old to me. I'm sure y'all are sick of hearing it. All right. Ephesians chapter 6, we find that the Apostle Paul makes a specific command to fathers. The specific, the specific command is, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. We're going to kind of do a topical message this morning. We're going to be in a few different places. But I just kind of want to go through a list here of some different things that the Apostle Paul specifically in his writings uh, talks about how a father should act. The Apostle Paul deals with fathers a lot. First John, the Apostle John deals with fathers a lot in his epistle. But I want to go few, through a few different things this morning about fathers. I want to start out, though, I was reading some recent statistics, all right? Recent statistics from 2023, so just last year. I want to read you some things about fatherhood. In fact, this is from the National Fatherhood Initiative. I don't know anything about them. I don't know if they're liberal, conservative. I don't know nothing about them. But this is what they said. They said that 17, and last year in 2023, 17.8 million children... Nearly one in four went without a biological father, stepfather, or adoptive father at home. 17.8 million. Every one in four kids had no father figure, whether it be adoptive, stepfather, biological, whatever, had no father figure in the home. Research shows when a child is raised in a father-absent home, <clears throat> they are affected in the following ways. They're at a greater risk of poverty more likely to have behavioral problems, greater risk. I didn't know this one. This is interesting. A greater risk. In fact, it's a 25% increase in infant mortality. Now, I don't know what all the science behind that is, but people, infants that do not have a father in the home, it is a 25% more likely chance for there to be an infant mortality, more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crime, more likely to become pregnant as a teenager. <coughs> more likely to face abuse and neglect, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, more likely to suffer from obesity, and more likely to drop out of school. The strength, though, of a father being present in the home, they found there's a lower, excuse me, they are at lower risk for a host of poor childhood outcomes. So having a father in the home actually contributes to not only the Wealth, or excuse me, the health of the child mentally, but also physically. Infant mortality rates drop. Low birth weights drop. Emotional and behavioral problems drop. Neglect and abuse. Injury. Obesity. Poor school performance. Teen pregnancy. Incarceration as juveniles. Alcohol and substance abuse. Criminal activity. And suicide. All lower when you have a man in the home. Factors that predict father involvement are these. These are the most vital and important parts of creating a strong bond between father and their children. Good parenting or co-parenting relationship with the spouse. A stable relationship with the spouse. Partner and parent support of involvement. Friends and family involvement. Employer involvement. Listen, some, some, some men focus so much on their job 
and their employers don't care if their home falls apart. They're worried about the bottom line. But some men are so focused on their job, they can't even spend time with their own family. Everybody all right this morning? All right, here we go. I know, these, these messages are never quite fun, are they? Uh, a father that's satisfied with his marriage is a better father. Listen to this one. Living with the children, involved in the partner's pregnancy, being a dad is vital to his identity. He want, he, his identity, part of his identity is, listen, I am a husband first, a father second, and a pastor third. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the order of importance. I'm a husband first, a father second, and a pastor third. All right? Being a father is vital to my identity. Notice, confident in his fathering abilities. No depression, no substance abuse, no domestic violence. How about this one? Why involved dads are good for moms. You know, being an involved dad is good for the mother. It's good for the other spouse. More likely to receive women that have a man in the home with them are more likely to receive prenatal care. They're less likely to smoke during pregnancy. They have healthier births. They're at lower risk of postpartum depression, lower uh, risk of postpartum stress, lower parenting stress, more leisure time, and higher marital satisfaction. I mean, I could go, I mean, I've got all these statistics. I could go on and on and on. And why involved dads are good for, uh, <coughs> for themselves. Why it's good to be an involved dad. Men that are involved in their children's lives report being happier, having better physical and mental health. They live longer. They have less depression, have increased self-esteem. They're more active in the community. And listen, all these other things. I mean, again, I could go on and on and on and on and on about all the, about all the facts Men that are involved in their children's lives, their children develop behavioral skills earlier. They develop reading skills earlier. They develop all sorts of social skills. They just, I mean, all of these things. Children that have a father in the home, uh, they learn to walk earlier. I mean, to talk. I mean, there's all these different statistics, right? I could go on and on and on. Understand, though, that it's vital, vital for a man to be involved in the home. In fact, I know this is anti-culture anti and everybody hates this kind of talk. But the way that God set up the home... See, originally in the Garden of Eden, the home was the fact that the man and woman were co-equal. That's how the original plan was. But we know the story. The woman ate the fruit. <coughs> she fell. And so now the setup of the home is now God is over the home. The man then is under God. The woman under the man. And the children under all three. Listen, it is biblical for a man to be the head of his home. You say, well, that's just a bunch of male chauvinism. That's just a bunch of old fuddy duh. Uh, that's not how today's society... Yeah, and look at today's society and the breakdown of the home. I'm telling I don't get up here and preach on the home all the time. I think sometimes preachers just... All they want to do is talk about the home and all they want to do is talk about the family. And I'm, I'm not against preaching on that, but there's other things in the Bible besides that. But I think it is important for every now and then for to be reminded what the biblical home is. The biblical home is where the man runs the home... The the wife is submissive to the husband, and the children are submissive to both. That doesn't mean that the husband's a dictator or a, or a lord over his home, but it does mean that he is in control and that he guides and leads his home the way that God wants him to. First of all, I want you to notice in the text that we originally talked about here, I want you to notice, first of all, a father ought to be in control. A father ought to be in control. A man that can't rule his own household, what does the Bible say about a pastor? A man that can't rule his own household can't rule the house of God. If I did not have, if my home was not in order, I would not be qualified to pastor a church. <coughs> a man ought to be in control of his own home. A man ought to be in control not only of his home, be, me, be in control of his wife. And I'm not saying, listen, my wife does not have to come and say, honey, can I go, can I go to the store? Is it okay if I, she, I mean, she doesn't have to do anything. The only, thing, the only thing my wife asks me is for more money. Somebody say amen right there. <laughs> That's the only thing my, my, I, my wife, she doesn't have to ask me if she can go get her hair done. She doesn't have to ask me if she needs done. I, half the time, I don't even know what she's asking money for. I mean, she could be buying drugs for all I know. I don't know. I'm, I'm teasing. She's not, she's not buying drugs. I may need some for too long. No, I'm kidding. But understand, in the home, 
a, a, a husband should not be controlling. Listen, my kids don't have to ask me if they can go into my refrigerator and eat my food. That's their home. I'm their father. They, I, th- sometimes we get in this idea that if we have a nuclear home or we start, you know, the, the man's in control, that he has to dictate every aspect. That's not like that at all. But a man should have control of his own home. Well, you know, preacher, I just don't know what to do with my kids. They just, they, they, they never listen to me. Well, that's because sometimes it shouldn't always be the words that they should be listening to. I remember growing up, and, and my dad used to do this. If I wasn't minding when I was little or wasn't doing something, he'd get that belt. and he'd put, I don't know if y'all ever seen this. He'd put that belt together like that and then and snap it real loud. Pop. Sometimes, listen, that was a form of communication that I was very familiar with. I, I, I can identify that sound from a mile away. I know what that meant. That, he told me and told me, and finally get that belt and pop that belt. And if, I, listen, I, I, knew that, I knew what that word meant. Amen? Listen, let me say something. Father, be, well, preacher, I just don't know what to do with my seven-year-old. They just don't listen to me. Well, this isn't in the Bible, but let me give you a little proverb. It's sitting in the Bible, but it's, it is a good proverb. Spare the rod... Spoil the child. That's not in the Bible, but it's a good principle. Amen. <coughs> Understand that the very first depiction. Now, I am not God. I, I know that shocks some of y'all. I know y'all are. Amen. I, I'm not God. I'm not anywhere close to God. But the very first depiction that my children ought to see of how the Lord reacts to his children should be how I react to them. Now I fail. I fail a lot. I, I, I don't. I'm not a good example sometimes. But understand, uh, I want my children to know that there are consequences for bad actions, and there are rewards for good actions. You ought to be in control. But not only should you be in control of your household, but there ought to be some compassion. Uh, let me say this: I am all for. I am against the feminization of our men in this culture. It is ridiculous. How boys are being raised. And by the way, part of the problem is that they're having to be raised by women because there's a bunch of men out there ain't worth the bullet to shoot them with because they run off and leave their kids and abandon their kids and won't have nothing to be involved with. Even if they're in the home, they never spend any time with their kids, never do anything with their kids. Understand, there ought to be some compassion coming from a father. What has happened is, is we have raised the generation of boys. Not only are they feminized, but they have no idea what a real man actually is. See, there's a ditch on both sides. Well, we just don't need any of that toxic masculinity and all that, you know, all that, all that toxic, you know, uh, you're trying to, uh, you know, it's okay for a man to paint his nails. You can be a man and paint. If you're a man that paints your nails. <laughs> not only are mine not painted, but I keep mine extra short too. I mean, sometimes I cut them to where they start hurting. I don't want anybody to think that I, amen. That's why I keep my hair short. In fact, you say, Pre- preacher, uh, you keep your hair short. Yeah, I got another haircut on Tuesday. Somebody say amen right there. <laughs> the feminization of boys. I'm against it. I'm against all these sissies and all this stuff. Say, well, you know, a real, a real man will, could, could wear a dress. No, he can't either. Well, I'm so confident in my masculinity that I can wear a dress. <laughs> I'm confident in something else, but anyway... <laughs> Amen. But there's also a ditch on the other side to where if a man, uh, uh, well, well, I'm a real man. I don't care about my family. I'm just going to go out and work and drink and hunt and, you know, and all this stuff. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a man, so I'm going to scream and holler and yell and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I'll get in a fight with anybody. See, that's the ditch on the other side. I'm going to tell you what a real father is. A real father knows how to be dangerous and knows how to be enforced and knows how to enforce and knows how to lay down the law but also knows how to do it in a loving, compassionate way. The Bible says here, fathers provoke not your children. Excuse me, Colossians 3.21 says, fathers provoke not your children to anger lest they be, what? Discouraged. 
If all you do, listen, sir, if all you do is come in, you say, well, I've had a hard day and I've worked and I'm putting food on the table. Yeah, that's all good, and we'll talk about that in a second. You ought to provide for your own house. But understand, if the only thing you do is come in and say, I put food on the table, now leave me alone. And all you do is come in and yell and scream and holler and fuss at the wife about everything and fuss at the kids about everything. Listen, just putting food on the table is not good enough to be a father. Amen. It's part of it, but it's not the only part of it. Provoke not your children to wrath, lest they be discouraged. And I've seen fathers who never had any relationship with their children. All they did is fuss at them and yell at them. And, and, and all the time was just so hard on them. And all the time was just, they had to be perfect and they had to do right. Listen, I'm not going to raise my kids like that. Now again, I am not the perfect father by any stretch of the imagination. Let me give you an example though of what I'm talking about. My son, is my oldest son Levi, smart boy, smart boy, smart as a whip. And Levi, like his father, struggles in the mathematics department. Oh, there he is up there I was looking for. He struggles in the mathematics department. Now, he's always gotten A's and B's, always. <coughs> well, this year's in seventh grade, and uh, he got, I th was it a D? Did you get a D on a report card? No, it was a C. It was, huh? C? Yeah, I think so. It was close to a D. It was close to a D. They changed the grading scale. When I went to, they're on a 10-point grading scale now. When I went to school, he'd have gotten a D with that grade. But, but here's the thing. You say, preacher, and, 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 and I, don't, I don't want to give away too much information if we're on the Internet. I don't think you know, anybody would be watching that would care. But, but I, we'd get calls from his teacher. I'm very concerned about Levi's grade. And this, this, I mean, da 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 just. And, uh, and you know how much I fussed at him over that grade? None. Because who in the heck in 10 years is going to care if he got a C in pre-algebra? And why am I going to stress my kid out and scream and holler and yell at him for getting a C in pre-algebra in the 7th grade? Why am I going to stress him out over that? Why am I going to holler and yell and scream and fuss at him and punish him? <laughs> who cares? Amen, 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 amen. Now, you can disagree with that. If you want to raise your kids differently, that's fine. I'm not saying to let him be lazy. I'm not saying to let him sit there and, listen, but as long as he's doing his best, I'm not going to sit there and stress out my 12-year-old over how good his pre-algebra grade is. Amen. If you disagree with that, that's fine. You raise your kids however you want to raise them. But I'm not going to, listen, my kids don't have to be perfect in order to promote my self-image. I'm not trying to live vicariously, making sure that there's some kind of perfect little angels. You say, well, I don't know if I'd agree with that. That's okay. When you have kids, or if you do have kids, raise them however you want to raise them. But understand, there ought to be some compassion. Notice it says here in the verse, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I looked up that word admonition, Brother Van. You know what that word admonition means in a Webster's 1828 dictionary? It means gentle reproof. Gentle reproof. I'm going to be honest. I'm not trying to raise my boys to be sissies, but I'm also not trying to raise them to think that daddy's only going to come in and yell and scream at them. Amen. It's funny. I asked them one time. <clears throat> I, I don't, it might have been even here. And I was saying, you know, because listen, I strive. I don't try to yell and scream. I don't come in slamming doors and punching walls and kicking stuff and screaming and yell at them. And if you ask them, you know, I, I don't come in and do that kind of stuff. I don't scream and yell at my wife. I don't come in and say, yeah, these dishes. I don't, none of that. <laughs> and I, I asked them that one time. I think I was preaching out somewhere. It might have been in Michigan. And I said, I don't scream and yell at y'all, do you? And Levi says, yeah, you do. So what are you talking about? He says, well, we're on the ball court. I said, that's a different. Listen, the, the ball court is a different dispensation. Amen, Brother Stewart? That's a different dispensation. That doesn't count, amen. The ball, I yell at Haddon and Lee. I yell at all of them. If you're on my ball court, you are not exempt from screaming and yelling. I get right. But you know what the home ought to be? The home ought to be a safe place. There ought to be some compassion coming from the Father. Some compassion. That word admonition means Gentle reproof. Correction in order to bring back. Nurture. Nurture. The nurture and admonition of the Lord. <coughs> that comes from the same root word and the same idea where we get the word nurse. You nurse somebody back to help. You care for them. 
My, listen, you know what those four boys are? Those four boys, I, and they, I, I don't know if they get embarrassed by it or not. really don't care if they do. But those are my babies, man. I, my wife fusses at me because the twins are getting ready to be, are they getting ready to be nine, right? Nine? Yeah. And I still call, they're the, they're the, they're the, 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 the youngest ones, and I still call them the babies. Where's the babies at? I saw I say, babies, come here, and they'll come running. My wife said, they're not babies anymore. They're the, I said, listen, they're the last ones to be born. They're the babies. Those are my babies. Those are my life. I love my kids more than I love my life. I, if, if, if one of them needed a kidney right now, I'd give my kidneys. If, they, if one of them needed both my kidneys, I'd give both my kidneys for one of them. You say, what about when they turn 18, you're going to No, they can, stay, they can stay in my house as long as they want to. Those are my children. Understand, though, a father ought to be compassionate towards them. Even in the midst of correction, there ought to be compassion, love. Notice, not only that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 11 says this, And as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. We find two more things in that verse. We find the fact that a father ought to charge, a father ought to teach, a father ought to show, a father ought to tell his kids, a father ought to instruct his kids. I don't want the school teachers and the preacher at church, I don't want them to be in charge of my children's primary education. When it comes to life and when it comes to the Bible, I want to be in charge about what's being pumped into my children. And a father ought to teach his children how to live, how to act, how to dress, how to do. A father ought to teach his kids, ought to charge them. Not only that, he ought to comfort them. A father ought to be a comfort. Now, I understand the mother is there. You know, my, my kids... My kids, nine times out of ten, when they, when they have an issue or a problem, nine times out of ten, they're going to their mother. That's just, that's just how southern boys are with their mother, amen? I was the same way growing up. My, if I had a problem, I went to my mother. Now, if I wanted something, I went to my dad. <laughs> All I had to do is say, Daddy, I really want that. And he said, right, let me see what I can do. And then, you know, he'd come home with it that night. That's just how he was. And, I'm, and now I'm turning the side. I always said, I'm not going to spoil my kids. I'm not going to, I'm not, you know. I always said, I'm not going to be that kind of dad that every time we go into a grocery store, they've got to get a candy bar and a soda. I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm eating my own words on that one, man. Dad, yeah, whatever, get whatever, you know. And I'm probably ruining them for their future wife, just like my mom and daddy ruined me for mine, amen. So, but listen to me. A father, a father ought to comfort a father, when, when, listen, there's too many situations. You listen, I'm about to say, make a statement, and it's a true statement. It's a hard statement. It's a true statement. In too many situations, when the father gets involved, it only adds further stress to the situation. Because of his temperament, because of his attitude, because of his anger, because of his outlook on life. And when a father gets involved, it only adds fuel to the fire. A father ought to, though, be the person that steps in and brings comfort to the situation and calms the situation and tries to help the situation. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. I'm saying I am trying to work at it, though. Last of all, we'll get out of here. This isn't a long message. We had a little extra singing. A father ought to care for his children. A father ought to care for his children. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8 says, But if any man, excuse me, but if any provide not for his own, and especially of those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. A father ought to care for his children. If you don't provide for your own house, listen, the Bible says if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house. Can I, can I make a statement? <clears throat> I believe that a man ought to work in such a way and set him up. And, and I know not everybody has this blessing in the, today's economy and today's society is wild. But I want to make it to where I'm providing for not just my household, but I'm able to provide for others when others have need. Amen. If any man provide not for his own, especially they of his own house. <laughs> well, they're not in my house. They're not my problem. If, if right now, if I, if, I, if, I, <clears throat> if I needed something right now, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm saying this with, with all honesty, if right now, if I had zero money in the bank and I needed, I needed a certain amount of money or I needed something fixed, I know I could call my daddy 
and I know that he would help me out any way he possibly could. I can say that about him. He would do it in a heartbeat. That's how I want to be. I know, I know people that don't even, that don't even, that, that are not even his family. They'll call my dad and say, hey, I need to borrow some money. And my dad will get, and, and listen, I'm, he, he wouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it about him this morning because he's my dad and it's Father's Day. I, I know he would give people the shirt off his back. And he's done it. He's done it for people in this very room. Because that's just how he is. Well, why? They're not his family. They're not in his household. Because he set up himself in such a way where he can help other people. And a, and a real man doesn't just care for his wife and kids. And, well, I ain't got no party. You're not my responsibility. A true man cares for others around him even. Amen. A real man is worried about the well-being of all those that he influences, of all those he touches. You know what the problem in today's society? We don't have any real men anymore. A man that is strong and masculine, but also caring and compassionate and tries to do his best to help and touch other people. A man that doesn't have to show how much of a man he is by the way he hollers and screams and pounds his fist but a man that's in control because, listen, a real man doesn't have to demand respect. A real man will naturally have it. And let me say this. And again, Father's Day message and Mother's Day messages, how do you give an altar call? You know, how, how do you? But let me say this in conclusion. I promise you that in 20 years, you listen to me, in 20 years, children aren't going to look back and say, you know what? Listen, my, my father, I'll say this, my father provided a very, very good lifestyle for us growing up. I'll be honest. Worked very hard. He's good at what he does and provided a very good and comfortable lifestyle for us growing up. And you know what? He would always, he worked, now he worked long hours, he worked hard hours. But multiple times a year, especially during the summer, every year, and we never missed a year, you know what he'd do? He'd get a, even up to this day, I mean, we're going in September to this day, get a big beach house, and we'd all go on vacation, all go out to eat and just relax. He did that every year. He made sure, he made sure that he spent time, maybe not as much time as he'd like to have because of the long hours he worked. But listen, I don't remember all the times that he came in late. And, you know the times, I, I remember the times where we were on vacation and all that kind of stuff. He coached me in Little League. I mean, that's kind of some mixed emotions there. I may have some PTSD. I'm probably giving my kids the same thing. And it's kind of like, yeah, my dad coached me, but, you know. You know. <laughs> but understand, a real man. You know what we need? We need some men to be fathers. Kind, compassionate, caring. Ones that will provide for their house, but not just provide the material things, but provide the spiritual things. Set an example for how a Christian ought to act and a Christian ought to live. Amen. Let's close out in a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church this morning. God, I know that sometimes these kind of messages are, they're not exactly the most dynamic and they're not exactly the most exciting. But, Father, it's good to be reminded of some things during these times. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd give Bible Baptists a group of strong men, strong fathers that will lead their household, that will care for their household, that will be compassionate, comforting, Lord, I pray that you would give us men. I don't want to be a, a church. Too many churches are so run by women and so, and, and they have to be. The, the men just fail and the women have to stay. Lord, I don't want that to be the case here. I want this church to be a church where the men are strong and they build and lead strong homes. Father, we love you. Thank you for all that you do for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.